Are you ready? Let's go. Ready. Ready. Yeah, ready when you are. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Okay, you ready? I'm ready. Holden Shepherd, Heidi Anderson, Jan Latta, Alison Patterson, welcome to my little show. Why do you call it a little chat show? Jan Nichols, Sam Iken, Annabelle Smith, Donna Mazza, Rebecca Watson, John L. Fraser, Tracy Jacobson, Adam Wallace, Monique Mulligan, Matt Glover, Karen Young. I don't even know where I'm going with this. Welcome to my show. Welcome to episode two of Josh Langley Gets to Know, season two, season two, yeah it is season two. Um, now before I go any further, please like the video, hit subscribe so you get to see all the videos and all that sort of stuff from my YouTube channel. I have just had the most amazing chat with a lady who's an ex got an extraordinary story to tell. She's written a book called Transit of Angels and this is a topic that we all need to talk about. It's about death, it's about grief, but it's also about hope. Um, yeah, Desney King is the lady's name and we really get into some amazing deep stuff. So strap yourself in. This is a beautiful, emotional, um, little couple of tears there at times interview and I really 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 hope you enjoy it so join me as we get to know Desney King Desney King thank you so much for coming on my show how are you going I'm I'm great today Josh and thank you so much for having me um it's a very special day for me today because it's the ninth anniversary of the first stroke I had. And so I, was, I was going to ask you about that before we got into, oh. into the book and, and that this was significant. I mean, because most people would go, this must be a traumatic day for you to go, oh, it's the anniversary <laughs> of my stroke. But to look at it that way. So how does it, how does it, what does it mean for you? What it means for me is that the gift of nine extra years that I almost didn't have because I had... I had a small brainstem stroke mm. and brainstem strokes are the ones that either you just drop and you're gone or you end up in um, locked in syndrome. Um, so I'm incredibly lucky and I, you know, I had my children late and so they were only 20 and 23 when I had mm. that first stroke and I, <sighs> I've had all these extra nine extra years with my kids and to do all sorts of things that, you know, dying at 60 is a bit, yeah. a bit early, I reckon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just, I'm so grateful. I just think it's an, a fantastic gift. Mm, and have those nine, and to see that as, as a blessing in a way, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, because when, as you said, when it could have gone so the other way, my mum had a stroke. Um, she's had two strokes now, but the second stroke knocked out a lot of her her memory and cognitive function, and um, so I just can't find the right words. And 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 having a conversation with her is 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 quite difficult because it's like normally you'd have a free flowing conversation. You, you would have all this past that you could talk about, and now it's like she has, has trouble accessing that. So it's like. Okay, it's like reinventing how do you talk to them again. So I know that's it's pretty pretty difficult. But you, obviously you didn't, your cognitive function, how, how was that? Um, that's been affected, mm. but relatively mildly, very specifically actually, it's been affected. I'm sorry about your mum as well. Because no, that's all right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She's, she's going well. She, she actually thinks everything's going quite nicely. She's forgotten her right. traumatic <laughs> childhood and all that sort of stuff. And, yeah. and I'll tell you something that's even more bizarre. You will actually appreciate this is yeah. she lived with her for about 15 to 20 years, excruciating rheumatoid arthritis, excruciating painkillers, yep. all pain medication on experimental um, drug treatments after the stroke gone. She had a wow. guy, she went to the rheumatoid arthritis guy couple of weeks ago he looked at the hands looked at her and said it's gone it knocked out that part of her brain mm -hmm. and no no more pain medication anything she's all off it oh. mm. 
Yeah, talking of blessings. Mm, yeah. mm, I know. And I, and she's been in so much pain before. It just it just broke me. And, you know, I know my brother and you know, all the rest of the family just broke us. But now that she's, yeah. you know, it's, 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 it's quite amazing. So anyway, but this is not about me. This is yeah. about <laughs> well, it can be. It's, it's fine. Because um, I, I, I want to get, because you're talking about the cognitive function and all that sort of stuff. But you have managed to write an amazing, incredible book transit of angels now I, I, to be honest i've only really just started to read it but i'm so engrossed in it it is it's got me from the first page and the book i know i'm just going to give away the first beginning bit of the book okay it's about a woman whose husband is killed in a motorcycle accident yes. can you yes. take us on a journey of, of what the book actually really is about Without spoilers, of really, course. <laughs> it, it, it's, uh, without spoilers, of course. It, it, so Transit of Angels is Angelica's story. And, and as, as you would have noticed, because you're a writer as well, um, it's written in the first person, present tense, almost entirely. So Angelica is telling her story and she we she's forcing us in the gentlest possible way to be right there with her the entire time. So she's 34 when Bill dies. She's a very young widow. They've had a beautiful life. So it's a love story. I, above and below everything and surrounding everything is that it's, it's a love story, not only their love story, but it explores other kinds of love, you know, other aspects mm. of love is a better way of putting it. Um, but really, it's the story of Angelica's, hate this word, but journey through grief and um, showing us that grief never goes away. Yeah. That after a long stretch of time, and it's individual for everybody, grief can soften. But it can also come back years later and just slam us and knock us flat. And um, that was really my motivation for, for writing Transit of Angels, to, to, to raise this issue of death and dying and grief, these issues of death and dying and grief that, that are pretty much avoided in Western society. Uh -huh. Pretty much taboo almost and we we don't have the rituals the supportive rituals and the community support and so on people never know what know what to say to someone who's newly bereaved and so on. so angelica's showing us she's taking us with her through all of that and through slowly very slowly eventually the ways she finds to emerge back into some kind of life, a very different kind of life mm. that still has been it for her, um, but in different ways. And so she ends up really in trying to, in trying to find Bill, to try and try, try to keep Bill with her. Mm. She ends up going on a spiritual quest and, and ends up in some interesting mystical kinds of situations okay, I'm looking, that are, I'm that are looking mainly, mainly supportive and and sometimes scary i'm, um, I'm so glad you've written about that the, the the grief and the and and you're so right we don't talk about death and grief in western society and it's to our detriment i was only a couple of weeks ago up in perth and i was doing a talk about my uh, people would know that I've written books about my search for the afterlife. And, and the question was asked, why don't we talk about death? And the only answer I came up with was fear. And, but I don't know the, the complexities underneath that because there are so many layers of, to that fear, but it is, it is that isolation that people feel when they are in the grief. I mean, I look, I have not experienced deep grief myself, but um, a wonderful, very, very wonderful close friend of mine and neighbor, she, her husband passed away about six years ago. And so I got to see 
the intensity of that grief. And what you've described with what Angelica goes through, it's almost, I'm reading that and I'm going, oh my God, that's, that's, that's my close friend. That's what she was going through. And the, the way you describe the, it's almost like as the reader, you, you've got to be, you've got to almost strap yourself in a little bit with this. And I think it's, 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 it is so essential that, that someone reads this to really understand what happens and what goes through and what the thought processes are or lack of thought processes that happens yes. in that and and the and and how time affects things and i like what you said that you know it could be years down the track but grief will just come back as a huge wave and smash you again it's like you never get over it that's 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 the no. thing people people say, oh you know you'll 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 get over it or you know but it, sometimes it's not as easy as that no, and I, and I think one of the things that I think you're right that a lot of it is fear. It, it, somehow when, when we're around um, death and someone who's newly bereaved and so on, it, it's a, it, most of us have a deep fear of our own mortality. Mm. Um, it's unconscious. Uh, it's a primal kind of thing for a lot of us, I think, or for, for most of us in Western society. And, and um, so I think, yes, it's fear and also it's awkwardness and not wanting to say the wrong thing. Yeah. So yeah. it's very, like, they, they, these are common things that people will say, well, I, I wanted to send her a card or call her up, but I didn't know what to say. So I ended up not doing anything. And yeah. that just, that, just increases the isolation of the person who is in that the early paralyzed almost state of grief, which can last for a long time. It can I know when my mother died, which is you know, 30 years ago now, um, I was in that kind of paralyzed state for two years after mm. mum died. And I felt as though someone had just dropped a massively heavy doona on top of me and there was nothing I could do to get out from under it. And the only thing that kept me going was that I had very two very young children at the time. And so life just hauled me along and I, mm. I had to go through the motions. But emotionally, that's, I was paralysed. Um, mm. And I, so I think that people don't know what to say they don't know what to do, and they're afraid of saying the wrong thing. Yeah, I, I, I know personally. I, I have, you know, I, I hate to say it now, but I, to be brutally honest, there was um, a friend of mine, you know, several years ago. She passed away from cancer, and oh. I saw her husband, and I didn't know him that well, and and he just, I saw him at the supermarket, and he looked so defeated by life, and I, I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. You know, the only instinct would have been is to not say anything at all, but just give him a hug. But even then I couldn't bring myself to do that. And I just, I held myself back and, you know, I wish I could have gone back. I could go back and change that. But I didn't because it was that fear. Like, I might say the wrong thing. Anything that I feel I'm going to say is just flippant and it just won't mean anything. Those sort of things. So I can understand that. And it's like, but how do we, how do we change that? What do we do? I think... I I've heard, I've read a lot about grief and, you know, I've experienced grief and so on. I'll, I'll talk a bit more mm. about the ways that's happened later on. But people who are grieving, they, they often say, look, just say anything. You can't say anything wrong. Just mm. say something. Just say, yeah. I don't know what to say. They, you know, just just recognize that I'm here in front of you and I'm grieving. Just that hug would have been, yeah. well, I don't know, it depends. You know, people are different with physical touch. Yeah, but true. Mm. I'm so sorry, mate, you know. And that's all, I, it, I don't that's know all what it needs, isn't it? That's all it needs. I don't know what to say. Mm. But for God's sake, don't say Ah, oh, it's, it's been six weeks, hasn't it, mate? Isn't it about time you started to move on? Yeah. I, 
That's the one thing to not say mm. at any point was because it, it just shows a complete lack of empathy and mm. understanding. Yeah. You know, that people don't just, ah, oh, move on from grief. You know, it's been a few months. I'll move on now. Because you, you write so viscerally about grief in the beginning of the book and you talked about your mother. Are there any other things that you've drawn on for your own experience? Um, it's, okay, your guests probably cry sometimes. Um, I usually cry too. <laughs> oh, that's fine then. We'll, we'll cry. We can cry. Um, I... Oh, here we go with the true confessions. I've been married three times and I had my two children with my third husband and we'd been in a fantastic relationship, 14 years. And that marriage exploded. I, it exploded. I, I didn't see it coming. Um, but what happened was that um, my ex who, you know, this is, 20 odd years ago now and and mm. i i'll say now that he and i have a we have a civil comfortable kind of non-relationship so it, it's mm. all in the past but at the time he met somebody else who had two children who were the same ages and genders as my two children and i will say that i home birthed my kids and i breastfed each of them for two years so I was a very engaged mother mm. um, in that sense. And they wanted to take the children from me. So what had happened was that that a couple of years before the marriage broke up, um, we'd reversed roles. My husband was feeling a need to get out of the work that he was in and he, he was going through a whole lot of stuff of his own, processing his own stuff and and we agreed that we'd both apply for suitable jobs and whoever got one first would take it you yep. know, to get him out of the situation. Mm. And I got the job and I went back to work. And um, and so at the time of the, the separation, he was the primary carer of oh. the children. Yeah, okay. And I was the provider. Mm. Uh, and... At the time, the family court, there was a big push for father's rights and men's rights in custody battles. And um, and the way the family court was dealing with that was by uh, favouring the primary carer. And so, oh my God, I fought. I fought so hard, Joss. Mm. Um, had just... It was ironic because it all sort of um, unraveled, starting on my daughter's fifth birthday and ending on my son's eighth birthday over a period of a, a month and um, or so. And um, I fought and I fought and I managed to get a week about shared custody. Um, but there was a lot of pressure on me for the next... 10 years or so at least, that they still, there was this pressure that, you know, there was a whole family over there that my kids mm. could be part of and they were with a single mum. And so there were, so I lost half of my children's growing up years and that's the toughest grief. Mm. That's mm. the toughest grief. Um, yeah. And it, I guess, hard for it, <clears throat> hard for people to understand, maybe. Um, yeah, I think I think a lot of mums, a lot of parents could actually they could feel that they could sit, you know, try and put yourself themselves in your shoes and go, okay, I can see that, I can see that. And so it's the emotional, it's that that separation. That's another element that you've drawn on from personal experience for, for Angelica. And, and to, to sort of lighten it up a bit and bring, well, for me, not for other people, but um, it, what's not on my professional CV is that I also, after, it was a direct result of that, that um, 
marriage breakdown, I, I went off and I learned Reiki. Um, so I was in, I was in a, I think I, I was in a state of grieving and, mm. and being pretty bit random for about 10 years, really. Um, and there was a Reiki teacher. At, I went and learned Reiki and it, your level one Reiki is for your own healing. Yep. And that, but then it, it just, it resonated with me so strongly and it, it's such a pure non-interventionary um, method of healing that I, I ended up training as a Reiki teacher and I taught Reiki and uh, practiced as a healer for about seven years. And um, a big part of that, and I do think sometimes what you need or what other people, there's a magnetism mm. that happens. And so I ended up working a lot with people who were dying slowly. Um, or most of them from cancer yeah. and one from motor neuron disease. And I was also volunteering in um, palliative care facilities. It's just wow. a complete strange once a fortnight going yeah. in. Yeah. So I was working, I was, I was volunteering and the, the, the really ill and terminally ill people I worked with, you know, that was, that was all voluntary work. Mm. Um, I went broke. That's beside the point, but, you know, that's just life. Um, but I work, I was, I spend a lot of time with the families as well. Um, the families and friends of mm. the people who were, and I spent a lot of time in palliative care facilities and wards and, and, um, oh my gosh, I met earth angels, everybody I, I ever who chose to work professionally in a palliative care facility, I, I call them earth angels, you know, to choose to work in that, yeah, that it's field. A, it's a, it's, it's but, not an easy field, but it takes a certain kind of person. I, I, I agree. And um, I was, I was going to say, so, because I know that you're on the, you're on the spiritual journey now, because you, you work those elements into transit of angels. But so that catalyst, that, that to shift, for you was that the that, that marriage breakdown all all that sort of your life just literally collapsing and that gave birth to this new exploration it did it did absolutely it did yeah and would you go back now and change anything no i don't i don't see the point in regret mm. you know i've had a rich and varied and quite extraordinary life in whole range of ways and all of that even well I couldn't have written this book I couldn't have written Transit of Angels <clears throat> if I hadn't lived the life I've lived um, and I wouldn't have understood how important it was to to write a book about death and dying and grief either I, I wouldn't have known that so I suppose one of the things that that interests me about the book and about yourself is that a lot of people talk about death and dying and and, and the lack of, of of discussion in western society about it and how that can be to our detriment um but you because in my own personal experience you can yes it's really thoroughly important to talk about that and to discuss it and get our kids talking about it but it's also to take that next step what happens after, even if it's just the question, what does happen? Opening up that curiosity and just going, well, I wonder, as opposed to, well, no one knows, let's not talk about it. Well, that could still be the quite the large elephant that's in the room. And and as 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 you know, you've 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 had experiences yourself which allow you to open your your mind up to bigger possibilities. So it's like the way you've actually dealt with and worked and, and structured in the whole concept of grief, loss, death, you also move into the other realm, the other, what is there? And is it all just nothing or is there something there? And if so, what is it? What experiences have you had to, that, that you've worked into that, that you have drawn from 
to, to go there? You don't mind me asking? <laughs> yeah, ask me anything, Josh. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> obviously the Reiki, I, the Reiki obviously changed you in some way, doing oh, that, tapping okay. into the healing and the energy work. I, when you have a, a Reiki attunement, for me anyway, it, it opens you up energetically so that um, you much you're much more aware of energy and and so on. Anyway, that's that's not quite answering your question. Um, <clears throat> what was your question? My question. This is back to the cognitive. I do have a slight memory loss, and I have mm-hmm. I've lost the capacity for sort of processing detail and holding it here so yeah, that, that's okay so, that, that's fine but the question was <laughs> what experiences have you had that you drew that you drew upon to work into transit of angels okay so it, it, the first is the sort of um surface thing of it, it, the more general experiences that mm. that are fairly common even in our western society and the, that you've talked about certainly in, in your work and mm-hmm. your investigation. Um, but it's very common for people to ask for a sign. I, I think people who are grieving, that, that it's quite a common thing. And Angelica does, and this is not a spoiler because it's in the blurb on the back of the book, but she yeah. does ask for a sign. And, um, and, and when people find a sign, whatever it might be, they, they grab onto it and they keep looking for it to recur. And as it recurs, they start to feel some comfort that, mm. yeah, you know, I, you know, Angelica asks for a sign. She thinks she gets a sign. She's quite sceptical and open-minded. So she double checks that to see mm. if it's real. She kind of does a double blind test and and so and so people feel comforted. The other very common thing that people do, which you know is also to the book in various ways, is that they they seek out psychics and mediums and try to make yep. contact with the person who has died. Um, there are other things in in Angelica's spiritual journey and won't say too much. Yeah, without well, too many spoilers, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, uh, you, you know, um, people do go on quests. They they look into different um, different modes of, yeah. of spirit. So they certainly look into meditation. Mm. A lot of people look into meditation. Um they might look for a guru or a, or a teacher of some kind who they think has the answers or can lead them to the answers or, or whatever it is. Mm. Um, yeah, the, that kind of thing. And that can be, that can work out well and that can work out quite harmfully and badly. And um, so I'm, I'm very aware of that from experiences I'm, I've had. What, looking for, and, for having teachers and gurus and stuff like that? Uh, yeah. And, mm. you know, you can get led down a, a sort of quite a... Yeah, I can imagine, path yeah. path or an or a, or a unhelpful path at, at the very least. Mm. You can get sucked in. And, get, and, and sidetracked. I mean, I must, I must admit, I'm actually, you know, I'm a bit sceptical about gurus and and stuff but and yeah. i and i shouldn't be um, it's just my normal skepticism but i know a lot of other people who have had amazing experiences and they've learned so much and 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 deconstructed themselves with the guidance of, of a teacher or guru what's one what's one experience that that you've had that that made you go holy hell this is real there is so much more to what <laughs> there is what's one experience that you've had that you can share well, that happened. This happened. The Reiki, the healing sessions I um, offered always went for two, usually three hours. So, um, it's another way, another reason I went broke. But anyway, um, 
<laughs> um, uh, here I am very happy. So, you know, we, we know that money is and everything. But um, increasingly people would come to me not only for a healing but for a reading. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> this is a standout for me. I, I, so, so something that, that um, healers will say, a very common thing that healers, mediums, um, psychics, is that it, it, to access pure flow, to, you need to get out of the way of this. You yeah. need to get out of the way so that you're a pure channel. Um, and, and it's very easy. I could tell eventually if, if I, if someone was speaking through me or, or really I was, had an awareness that was coming Mm, through me, mm. I could tell the instant my mind clicked in to start to interpret that. And I would tell, tell my client that I would, I'd say, okay, you know, this is, we're really finished now because. I'm starting to interpret this and that's that's not ethical and it's not useful oh, okay. because I could be completely wrong. Mm. You know, it's, it's my mind now. It's not a pure transmission, if you like. So anyway, there was this young woman who'd come, <clears throat> she'd come all the way. She was working, she was a Canadian, but she'd been working in Japan as a teacher, as a lot of young people do. And she came to Australia uh, for a visit um, and one of her friends was one of my clients. Yep. So um, clients, no, oh, you've got to go and see this Haley. You've got to go and see this Haley. She's a mate, blah, blah, blah. And um, so this young woman came and she had healing and whatever. I don't remember the first session, but a year later, she's back in Australia and she came for another session and she really, really, she was, she was fairly self-absorved, which is, which mm. is, a, you know, aren't we all at yeah, times? Yeah, yeah. Um, Me especially if you're going to a healer who you think yeah. is psychic, you yeah. know, it's all about you, right? So she wanted to know when she was going to meet Mr. Wright. That was really the thing, you know, yeah. and we'd sit. Fair enough. We, it's, a, we, it's a relevant question to ask. <laughs> it's it, and it's of course it's a preoccupation you know mm. if you if you're yearning for a relationship and mm. it's not you know yep. so you, you you like some insight into when and who and etc cetera, etc cetera. so but then she was very adamant about all this and very very sort of intense about it all and we're sitting opposite each other across a well, like a little square table mm. with, you know the nice cloth and the candle and the, all that and um we sat there for about five minutes and I wasn't getting anything, nothing. Well, this Absolutely is awkward, nothing. isn't it? <laughs> this is awkward, isn't it? As I said to her. And I, I said to her, look, occasionally this happens. You know, it's, I, I don't make this stuff up. And if nothing comes through, I have to be honest with you. There's nothing coming through. She was getting pretty pissed off. Um, and um, probably sort of yeah, disillusioned. Let's yeah, say yeah, she yeah, was yeah. getting quite yeah. annoyed and annoyed. And um, it's a very awkward situation in the room. Yeah. And then suddenly, suddenly, this massive dog, big St. Bernard dog, started leaping across above her head like this like an so this is this is now is this in your mind's eye superimposed over it or are you seeing with your eyes this dog i, I was seeing with my knowing well wow, okay I, yep 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 i'm clear sentient mm-hmm. primarily but it's, i can that involves seeing stuff and very rarely hearing stuff mm. it, but it's a knowing but in this case yes it was very visual there was just this it, it, screen's not big enough, but it was jumping and it was a huge dog and it was just leaping over her head, backwards and forwards, backwards. And, forwards. and so cautiously, I said to her, Look, I am actually getting something now, uh, but I doubt very much it's in answer to your question. 
what I'm seeing is this huge dog waving backwards mm. and forwards, blah, 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 blah. And she burst into tears and, you know, just, mm. oh, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, that's my friend's dog. And I promised my friend, she's back in Canada, her, her beautiful dog died only a few weeks ago and I promised her before that I before I asked you anything else, I'd ask you how her dog was, if her dog was okay. Oh. And, and I was so caught up in my own stuff, I, I forgot to ask. And, and she said, and the most extraordinary thing is that my friend loved this dog so much that she's got a, a huge, bigger than life-size photo of the dog leaping like that up above her bed. <laughs> Wow. And wow. I just look, Josh, I did, how would I make up something like that? Yeah, yeah, I know. It's just I, these random things. That, but... that is utterly, that's the most convincing experience I ever had because, you know, I'm skeptical. Mm. Angelica remains open minded and questioning right to the end of the book. You still are. Mm. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah. You've got to have the your good bullshit detector going. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And but that one, I no. Uh, that I, left you without that. Was that what? What? Uh, um, oh, there's a term for it that I can't. Uh, it, it escapes me at the moment. Where it's suddenly, oh uh, yeah, a belief system crash is where you normally you go along thinking this is how the world works, and suddenly something happens, and you go ah uh, ah uh, ah uh, ah. Uh. So that would have been a, a good. I opened a sort of belief system crash for you then. It was, it was really, I suppose. And it, it just, yeah, I mean. Wow. It just, and then, and then stuff started coming through for her. About ah, so it was like the, it was almost like a dog was sort of needed to come through and then it just the flow sort of happened. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it was a lesson for her about, um, Caring about others as well, mm, mm. You know, about the push she'd made to her friend. Yeah. So spirit or whatever we want to call it was was giving her that very clear lesson that, you know, you're a bit self, self-focused sometimes, sweetheart. You did make a promise to your friend mm. and mm. we're not going to talk to you about any of your stuff until you are going to get the dog in. Where's the dog? Yeah. Where's the dog? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, oh, so, oh my god, it's a Saint Bernard. Holy hell. What's huge. That? <laughs> and it's moving. <laughs> I, I, I love I love I love that. I think I think when when people have little moments like that where they can actually it goes beyond their own doubt. You go, okay. And and, yeah. and the significance for, for that lady would have been huge. It was huge. It was. Yeah, and I mean, there was another experience I had um, with a young man. It's a, what I did want to say way back at the beginning that I that I forgot to say was that um, people who have a religious faith in Western society have that uh, they have that comfort. They they people who give themselves over to a religious faith. They know what happens after you die. Whether that's they entirely that. accurate. Well, but they, but they, they have that belief. They have a belief, yes, yes. They have a belief mm. that is that is a hundred percent true for them, and that is a great comfort for them. And I respect that. Mm. Completely respect that. I grew up with that. In fact, um, I lost it when I was twenty, um, but. I do respect it, and and it is one way that that people yeah can, I, and and uh, deal with great anyway. The sidetrack that I, I, I do I, I do agree with you because it, it it acts as an anchor for them. Yes. So instead of yes. spiling around, they go. This is my anchor. This is my 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 belief, my, and I will see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's usually uh, in community as well, and that helps. So true. True. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's anyway. a very good point. Very good point. 
So what reminded me to say that was that I had this young guy come to see me for a healing and he'd grown up very devoutly Christian. He was in his early 20s and I um, can't remember many, many of the details of, it, yeah, of his story, but he, he was starting to question his faith a little mm. and somehow he'd heard about me. And um, also I never sort of wore flowing purple gowns or had a crystal ball or anything like that. So people, people who wanted somebody. So trees cloth and flowers in your hair and all that sort of jazz. Uh, <laughs> <not this thing. laughs> um, yeah. So he felt safe coming to me, I guess that's or as safe mm. as he yep. Yep. coming to me. He was scared, very scared as well. Um, of what he might uncover, but he asked specifically for a past life regression. Interesting. Which are, there's one of the Reiki symbols. Um, if you if you go far enough through the Reiki training, there's there's a symbol, sacred symbol that's used to dissolve time and space. Mm. Now this is a leap of faith, right? Invisible symbols. Yeah. Okay. What? That I just draw <laughs> in my head, in my mind, right? All yeah. I all I did, all I, this young man lying on his back on the massage table, warm blanket over him because people get very mm. cold usually mm. in, the, in warm weather. So, and I had my, I can't do it upside down, but anyway, I had my thumbs on his third eye. Yep. And hands cupped over his eyes. So, and that's, it's the third eye. He, you know, that's the chakras. Oh, I'm getting weird, yes. Josh. So. Mm, that's all right. No, we <laughs> just that... we just go with you. We just create the beautiful space for you to keep talking because I'm loving the story. This is the energy center. It's a third eye through which you're calling. Yeah. You're calling it something different. I call it a third eye. Yeah, um, just the uh, inner side yeah. or whatever. Yeah. The, Mind's eye, you're calling in, in the mind's eye. eye. Yes, there you go. Yeah. Um, and all I did was stand silently behind him with my hands in that position. So, pouring the energy into focusing the energy into his third eye and silently asking that he, his question, you know, this mm. young man, whatever his name was. Um, would like to access past life. He's looking for evidence of past life, whether that's true or whether it's not. Yeah. And the most incredible thing happened. Um, he started shivering. Mm. Took a while. I mean, he was probably on the table for an hour. I don't know. It, yep. Time solves as well for, for mm. me in, in that situation. Um you're a wizard, Joss, because I haven't talked about this publicly before. Oh, excellent. <laughs> First time. <laughs> so he, um, he started to shiver and then his arms started moving and then he started, his legs started sort of as though he was running. Mm. And I just quietly said to him, you know, okay, are you okay? Can you tell me what's happening? And he's saying... My men, my men, we're under attack. We're under attack. You know, I've got to save my men and it's freezing. And I said, where are you? And he said, he said, I'm a, I'm a centurion and I'm, I'm a Roman centurion. And I'm, we're in the snow and we're, 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 we're on this mountainside and my men are getting slaughtered and I can't save them. And he was crying and he he was slashing with his sword, with mm. his arm, and um, and he just he ended up just sobbing, sobbing, sobbing that he lost all his men and he survived. Wow! And had this terrible guilt, and so on. And I had to then use, eventually use other because he mm. was so distressed. Mm. It was. So real. Uh, it was probably the, the most um, 
viscerally and physically real past life regression that I ever witnessed. Wow. And the fact that he was physically sort of acting it out in a way. Oh, yeah. very much so. And was so distressed. It was, it was, he was completely in that mm. time and experience. And I eventually used calming words and soothing words to to, to bring him back and symbols, the Reiki yeah. symbols that, you know, that you can you can reverse that symbol that dissolves time and space. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Um, closes off and you yeah and I just brought him back and slowly and put another blanket on him because he was freezing because well he was, he was in snow, snow. <laughs> yeah he was in the snow he was I, 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 I suppose it's it he I know some people you know everyone at home I know this gets flaky but he, he would have carried that 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 energy of that 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 regret, that trauma, all that he would have carried that energetically into his yep. current life, and yes. and that's what was most probably driving him to see you, and then you helped clear that or allowed him to release it more and more accurately for yeah, him to release it. Yes, and to understand it, mm. and to I, I think for him. I, we discussed it afterwards, you know, eventually when yep, good. he was able to get off the table and sit down and we could chat again. And um, it answered his question, it, 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 you know, completely mm. that, yes, for him, he was absolutely convinced now that there were past lives and that the faith system he had grown up with um, and was starting to have questions about, didn't answer all his questions, and that a big question had just been answered in a very um, convincing way for him. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it also, we he'd also felt guilty about not looking after people well enough. In ah, this life. gotcha. So he that's how it kind of manifested. Yeah. About not. He always but didn't really do everything he could to look after people and so on, and it and it cleared that. Yeah, and he recognised that, and he thought about people he'd been having those feelings about, and he, I don't feel like that about them anymore. Wow, it just suddenly just oh, released. I don't, I don't feel that. Wow, I don't feel like a guilty person anymore. Wow, what a, li- what a liberating thing for him. So do you know if he stayed a Christian or anything? Or Never saw him again. Yeah. And that's it. That's Never the role you played in his life at that moment. That's all he needed yep. and had that little, yep. little. actually, no, that would, would have been a quite a momentous moment for him, quite a huge. shift huge. shift in him. Oh, yep. We could talk about this forever, <laughs> Desna. You know that. We could keep carrying on. Yeah, we could. We could, but we, we're going to have to wrap this up. And I really encourage people to read your book, Transit of Angels, because I think it's a really important, relevant book for, for these times, especially, I mean, look, it's for any time, really, because, it, it, yes, it does, the topic of death, grief, but it's like, as the book moves on, it, it's like shifting from winter to spring. It, there's elements of hope and being able to see life differently come in and i think that's that's what we all need so i i I recommend transit of angels to everyone where can they get it from how they can they get in touch with you desney how can they get in touch with me my website is desneyking.com.au i'll put it down Um, below thank you um and um transit of angels is available for sale online worldwide as a paperback and an ebook um, I've got a Facebook page. I've got an Instagram page, Disney King Walter, Disney King Walter. Beautiful. Um, and they can get to them from your website. Are. Thank you, pardon? They can get to those pages from your website. So if people go to your website, they can find your Facebook page and your Instagram, yes, all yes, that. Yes, and YouTube, YouTube as well. So there are a couple of in- other, other interviews on YouTube that are probably not nearly as interesting as this one or as <laughs> revealing, but... <laughs> 
you have a way, Josh. <laughs> thank but you, yes, Disney. Um, <laughs> look, look, Disney, look, thank you for sharing some really great insights with us and, and some beautiful little moments there. And I really, really appreciate your time. And um, good luck with everything. And I hope the book really takes off. Thank you. Thank you very much, Josh. It's been wonderful speaking with you. Wow.